Beloved uh, brethren, I welcome you again um, to our discussion or to our study of the Word of God. Um, in a couple of installments that I have made so far, looking at who Jesus is in relation to God, we have established that Jesus is God, Jesus is eternal, Jesus was truly God and truly man. He had to be both to be able to reconcile man and God. The one who could hold both their hands and bring them together and make peace. He is our peace. Now, we looked at a number of things very important. Why did he come as a human being? Why was he made a little lower than angels? It was for a little season that he might test death for everybody. This is not an ordinary death. It's a propitiatory death. It's a redemptive death. It is the death that would satisfy all the justice requirements of God. Now, but having shown that he was in the form of God and he truly emptied himself of the privileges and rights of his nature when he became a human being, it doesn't mean that he could not exercise them, but the emptying means in the place of humility, he chose not to exercise them because if he had exercised them, then probably no one would have managed to arrest him and to crucify him. There wouldn't have been a cross. See, he had to, uh, knowing your true place as the creator of everything, and you subject yourself to blasphemous men, sinful and fallen men who claim to be holy, when you know everything in their hearts. It is the, the deepest form of self-humiliation you can ever think of. That is what our Lord went through. Now, I know that there are issues. I did mention that in the history of the church, there have been lots of heretical teachings. Heretical teachings arising from the fact that some believed that Jesus was only divine and not human. He had a phantom human board, not a real human board. Now, the moment you say that, you are eroding the atonement that he, that, that he made. You are denying that he truly died. You are denying that he truly shed his blood. Therefore, you are denying the basis for justification. You, you are denying the basis for our sanctification. You are denying the basis for our reconciliation to God. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now, if he had a phantom board, how come he had blood? How come he, he, he felt as we felt? He cried, he wept. He felt sorrowful, he felt weak, he slept, he felt hungry. Everything that we are, he was. And the Bible says he was tested in every point. Now, when it says that, sometimes we take it for granted. It really means that he was tested beyond what we can take if we are the ones tested. He was tested, he was stretched to the very limit of of, of being tempted and tested. And he did not sin even once. He was found without sin. So, so truly then, we must understand that he really became a human being 
like, like us, even though he was God. Now, what I want to focus on is something else very important as well, because one of the heresies was that he was just human and not God. Others would also say he was a created being. He was not eternal. All these kinds of heretical things, they arise from how people understand scripture when they read scripture. And sometimes when you read scripture and look at certain things superficially, you can really get lost and make erroneous conclusions. Now, what I want to do is for us to go to, uh, to, 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 to Colossians uh, chapter 1. Uh, we can start from about verse 15 there about. I just want maybe verse 15 um, to about 17. I want to talk to this issue of whether Jesus Christ was a created being or not. Now, this is a very crucial question because if it is not answered correctly, our understanding of salvation and everything else becomes flaky. Now, Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says, He, meaning Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For all things in heaven and on earth were created by him. All things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, all things were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. I will stop here. We could have read all the way. Um, up to the end. Maybe let me read also verse 15. He is, verse 18, he is the head of the board, the church, as well as the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that he himself may become first in all things. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in the Son, and through him to reconcile all things to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross. I will, I will stop here now. Very important. The, those who say that Christ Jesus is a created being, they look at the word firstborn. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And again, it comes... Um, Verse 17, he himself is before all things. And verse 18, the firstborn from among the dead. Now, the word firstborn has troubled many a Christian in the history of um, uh, Christianity. And many, many heresies heretical teachings that arose arose from not understanding what words mean. Now you recall I keep saying to people please pay attention to grammar, the context of the passage, uh, the syntax, everything. Pay attention to everything. If we truly believe as I do that scripture is inspired 
then it means the comma, the full stop, the position of these grammatical things, so important because that's how meanings are made. You can't just over assume and gloss over and say, oh, no, 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 that's just language. That's not what it means. Then if we say that we are saying God is so unwise that we are the ones who are to judge that language is to be used this way. God doesn't use language, but he is the one who created languages in the first place. Now, so what does the word firstborn mean? What I would do is to read, <clears throat> I've had um, some preachers who also like to use these Greeks, they will tell you, oh, the Greek word is this much. And sometimes they superficially judge on these things and give you a skewed interpretation of scripture based on just jumping to that word. So being uh, uh, proficient in Greek does not make you a good interpreter of scripture. It is very useful as a tool for helping you to arrive at the correct meaning but you might even miss the meaning if you do these things superficially. What does firstborn mean? I'm reading here the notes that tell us what that word is. The word there, the Greek term is prototokos. It has two primary meanings, either first in order of time, such as a firstborn that is born first or it could refer to one who is preeminent in rank now these are the two meanings of the word i have heard beloved people of god teaching and saying jesus and they will throw the greek word is the prototokos he was the first born and once we all became born again we we were like him he ceased to be the only one he now had so many who are like him so prototokos he was the template he was the pattern after which everything was modeled i've heard countless times this being presented that way now, you see the danger is someone is just going to the Greek text and they've seen that prototokos has two meanings, order of time, which means something is come first, or order of rank, which is a right to rule, being an heir, being a ruler, being head, being an authority over something. That's what prototokos also means. So these are inheritance rights. Someone who has inheritance rights is prototokos, right? Now, let's try to see, and now come back to our text. <clears throat> when you read this text from the verse I read, which is verse 15, by the time you get to verse 18, verse 18 ends by saying, so that he himself may become first in all things. First in all things, which means you must have the preeminence. Now, once you see that, it means when you read the word firstborn, the emphasis in this passage is not in Christ being the first, first creation, the first one to be created and then used as a template by God to create the rest. That's not it. The idea of firstborn in this chapter is speaking to his inheritance rights. Countless places in scripture that tell us that he is the heir of all things. That idea that he is the heir of all things is what we mean by prototokos. These are inherit. He is the one who has the inheritance rights. He is the one who has the right to rule. 
He is the one who is the king of kings and lords of lords, the prince of the kings. So he is the prototokos. He is the supreme one. It's about supremacy here. That's the issue being discussed in this passage. So it's not about him being the, the form that was used to make other things so that they will be exactly like him. That's not the issue here. It's about his first place as the owner, as the heir, as the creator, as the ruler, as the sustainer, as the maintainer, as the protector of the universe. That's what he is. That's Jesus. So now, he is, verse 15, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, notice even the preposition over. The moment he say he is the firstborn over. I would, I would like it to be put like this if it was about first in order of time they would say the firstborn before all creation you see that but they are not saying that's a firstborn over meaning the one who has the right to rule over all creation that's what it means that's what firstborn means there but now you see people have taken this word out of context and have said no he's called the firstborn they clearly he has been he is, he is a created being. That's what people say. He's a created being. How? He's a created being. Listen to the rest of the verse. Go to verse 6. He, verse 15. He is the firstborn over all the creation. And I have said the firstborn, firstborn, that means that he has supremacy over all creation. He has inheritance rights over all creation he has a ruling rights over all creation he is the ruler he is the possessor he is the owner of all creation that's what it means verse 16 for all things in heaven and on earth were created by him let's stop there now the moment you say for all things were created by him. By him. That means he is a creator. He is the one who created them. All things were created by him. He is the creator. Whether they be in heaven... So think about all the galaxies, think about all the planets, the stars, some that are billions of miles away from us, some are that are closer, some are some that are a million times bigger than the earth where we are living now. The earth is a very small planet relative to some stars and 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 uh, and, uh, and planets. So so you are saying all those things, the marvels that science has discovered and is yet to discover, and the, the laws that they obey, all of them were created by Christ. Whether they be angels, archangels, arch archangels, principalities, dominions and powers in the holy order of angels, all of them were created by Jesus Christ. He created all. And the writer goes on to, 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 to finish the verse, the verse by saying, All things, here is the emphasis, all things, whether visible, mountains, stars, the moon, the clouds, oceans, people, trees, Beasts of the field, fish of the sea, beds of the air, those are visible. And the invisible spiritual beings we don't see. Whether thrones or dominions, this is a very 
encompassing statement. He's trying to show that there is nothing you can conceive of which was not which was not made by Christ. There is nothing which you can conceive of which existed on its own account. All was because of Jesus Christ, the creator. He is not a created being. He created everything. Listen to verse 17. He himself is before all things. And all things are held together in him. Now, again, the idea that he himself is before all things implies that he has preeminence. He has preference. He is above all things. He is eternal. He doesn't have a beginning. You see, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. You see, so he is before all things. Before anything could exist, he already was. That's why he says to them, before Abraham, I am. He didn't say I was. I am. He is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. He pre-exists creation and will post-exist creation when it is consummated. He is the same. So that's what, that's what it means. He is before all things, meaning he has preeminence over all things. This is the emphasis in this entire passage. Now, notice, if you think that he is a created being, then you are mistaken. Verse 17, he himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. This idea of held together is a very interesting concept because what it means is that he is the sender of all creation, the laws that govern the universe in which we live, and the relationships among the various universes you have, if you think in terms of the planets and all that, the forces of gravity, everything, everything obeys the laws of nature you see, which physicists are studying in physics and geophysicists and all that. All these things, the, each one of them sticks to the law that it was created to be governed by. So that if the earth slows its pace of orbiting around the sun, we will be frozen. So that if the moon draws a little bit closer to the sun than it should, then the earth will be flooded by the oceans. The tides will sweep the earth away. There are lots of complicated laws that govern the way the universe works. And scripture here is saying, this idea of saying all things are held together by him, it means he is the sustainer. He maintains the universe and the laws that govern the functioning of the universe. In some place, the psalmist says, Oh, Lord, even the oceans obey the edicts you gave them. None of them trespass the boundaries you set for them. That's him. The laws he set and the boundaries he set for everything are respected by those things. And he holds the universe together. Let's take that idea of holding the universe together. Let's go to Hebrews. I just want to show you that this is an, an issue that apostles have, have kept on uh, hammering on. Now, Hebrews 1 verse 1 to 3. After 
after God spoke long ago in various portions and in various ways to our ancestors through the prophets, in these last days, he has spoken to us in a son whom he appointed heir of all things. Whom he appointed heir of all things. Whom he appointed heir of all things. That phrase there is saying he is the firstborn. That's what the idea of firstborn means. Being an heir of all things. That's what we mean by prototokos. Prototokos. But now you see people like to say prototokos. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. He yes. was the first to be created. Then everything else followed. That's not... Here, notice... Here it says, whom God appointed heir of all things. When did he appoint him to be heir of all things? From eternity. Heir of all things. Notice it continues, through whom he, meaning God the Father, created the world. He is the agent of creation. The Son, verse 3, is the radiance of his glory and the representation of his essence. He is the exact. Remember that God is spirit and therefore invisible. But here we have one who came in our likeness who is the exact image of the invisible one now listen now to our verse verse, verse um, three ends it ends by saying and he meaning jesus sustains all things by his powerful word this is exactly what colossians was saying let's go to colossians 1 verse 18. Verse 18 said, No, it's not verse 18. What verse was it? What verse was it? Verse 17. He himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. You see? Hebrews, they said, he sustains all things by the word of his power. Exactly the same as what we have here. Now, it can be a created being who can sustain this universe with all these stars that are far, far bigger, a million times bigger than the Earth, some of the stars, and some planets that are so, so big than the Earth, and all the various complex laws governing everything so that it functions exactly as God originally designed it to. There is no chance here. There is no Darwinism here. There is no evolution. Everything follows a particular law meticulously laid out by God, even if we can't see it. This is why Paul says in Romans, even the invisible attributes of God, we see them by looking at the creation. The creation is showing tremendous Tremendous ingenuity, tremendous craftsmen of God. It shows that there's some super, super intelligent being who maintains all these things. And that supreme being is Christ Jesus, our Lord. When it is said he is the firstborn, it means he is first in rank. He is the authority. 
Now, I, wa I want to show you that um, so that you, you don't doubt what I'm saying. Let's see. If you come to Hebrews chapter 2, I think maybe around verse 12 or verse 11, I will check. Let me just check very quickly. Um, <clears throat> here we go. If you come to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For it was fitting for him, for whom and through whom all things exist. Now, the idea of saying for whom means these things were done for him. That is why he is called the heir. The one who inherits things. The heir. And through whom all things were made, which means he is the agent of creation. Now, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. I want the word pioneer there. Now, the word pioneer exactly conveys the same sense as the word firstborn, conveys the same sense as the word heir, the one who has inheritance rights. Why? Because the pioneer here means the prince, the supreme leader, the trailblazer. So he is the one who has the preeminence. You see that? The one who is the author of things. He is the beginning of things. He is the one who is making them exist. You see, these words, they mean the same. He is the, the captain of our salvation. Meaning the trailblazer, meaning the prince, the supreme leader of our salvation. Because he authors the salvation, he guarantees the salvation, he sustains the salvation, he is the sacrifice, he is the high priest, he is the sanctifier, he is our brother, he is the last man, he is our representative yet, he is everything, he is everything, he is the atonement. Is a propitiatory sacrifice. Oh my goodness. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. Now, so the word firstborn can never and should never be thought of as implying that Christ Jesus was a created being. If someone does that, it means they don't understand. And because they don't understand, they make erroneous deductions. He holds all things together. That means he, all, all the principles you can think about emanate from him. He is even the first born from the dead. Now, that doesn't mean that he was the first to rise from the dead. Because he himself raised many people from the dead. Some other people try again to, to say, no, all those other people were resuscitated. resuscitated. They were not really raised from the dead. But I think that Paul here is making the same argument that he has priority. You see that? Of all the people who have arisen from the dead, he is the supreme example of the spiritual resurrection that we shall see. All these are other ones like Lazarus and so forth, they were raised from the dead and they died again. He rose and rose once forever. He will not rise up again. You see that? So he is the supreme example of the ultimate resurrection that we shall see of the saints. So he is the prototypus again. It's not talking about him being the first to rise from the dead. It's talking about him being the supreme example of the resurrection that we shall experience. Hence he is called the first fruits from the dead. He is the, the, the finest, the, the, the most perfect example of what shall be. That's what it means. 
So, so in closing, I'm saying, please, when you read the word of God, pay attention to words. And also listen to people who, I know there are people who like to just jump to this Greek words. They'll say, the word is this, this, this. And they don't take time to tease out the nuances of the word. And then you come back to the context and see what is the emphasis in the context. So that you don't just say because the word means this, so that's what it means. And they are given options of what the word means. It can't mean all, all of those things at the same time. There must be a specific meaning the author was trying to communicate. The context now helps you to see what is the emphasis. It is clear in this passage that it is the supremacy of Christ which is being emphasized here. Why is the Apostle Paul taking all the pains to emphasize that? Because the, the Colossian church was being troubled by false teachers called Gnostics. Now, let me give you a little bit of some history. Gnostics were philosophers. Their name essentially means knowledge seekers. So, so, so these people were philosophers. And so what they had now done was to say, there are two things you must understand. Spirit is pure. Matter is evil. So matter, which means all these created things are material, right? The earth, we see the trees, everything, the beasts and all that, the particles, everything you see, that's matter, it's evil. Now, so their argument was this. Since God is spirit, he is the purest spirit ever. He cannot create things that we see because these things are evil. They, came, they emanated from something evil, right? And then they went on to say, so really God, the, the original, the purest spirit could not create these evil things. Now, once they say that, it means God could not have become a human being because a human being is part of the matter, which is evil, according to them. So, therefore, they are denying the death of Christ. They are denying that Christ is the human body. Do you see? That's why the Apostle John is very angry at them who say, who deny the Son that he came in the flesh. Sometimes we miss these things because... We, History is far away from us. These are the things that were being taught. So the conclusion of the Gnostics was that God could not have created the universe because the universe is made up of evil. It, it has an evil principle governing it. It can't be God. God could never have become a human being. He can be in touch with evil matter. He is pure. That's the argument. So those are the two things. They have rejected Christ already. Now, they have rejected the humanity of Christ already. Then, then they, they say, oh, okay, so how do we explain where did this universe come from? They say, oh, now God began to beget so many semi-gods from him. He was begetting. Jesus was the first begotten before others were begotten. So, 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 if you think about, think about Adam as the first man created by God. If you think about the length of years he lived and what we are living now, we can't even match. We, got, we are not even 1% of the length of life he lived or Matusela and so forth. So, so, the idea that from Adam up to where we are, there is a, a decrease in the, in the perfection of the humanity. I'm just using it as an illustration to, to help you see what the Gnostics were saying. So they were saying, as God continued to beget these gods and these gods were begetting, finally one who was very distant from the purest spirit called God here is the evil one who created all these things. So they say Jesus was pure because he was 
the first emanation, the first begotten from God. You see that? <laughs> this is their argument. Now, once you understand that, you begin to see that this church was being buffeted. And the objective of the Apostle Paul in writing this is to demonstrate the supremacy of Christ Jesus and show that contrary to what the Gnostics who are troubling you are, uh, are saying, he is actually the creator. Remember that these Gnostics were teaching people angel worship. It's also here. Um, I just don't remember which verse now. Uh, but I think it's in chapter 2. If I were to go to chapter 2, I can read that very quickly for you. Um, I think it's around verse 14 or so, um, where he says, uh, let's see, 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 let's see. Here we go. If I read chapter 2, verse 18, it says, let no one who delights in humanity and the worship of angels pass judgment on you. Now, I just want that part which says the worship of angels. Now, it's now very easy to see that the Gnostics worshipped angels. Why? Because angels are spirits. Therefore, they are Pure, according to their teaching, spirit is pure, matter is evil. So, Paul now is showing the supremacy of Christ even over angels because here he says, for, for all things in heaven, where they say they are the purest things which are spiritual, these Gnostics, all things there in heaven and all those that are here on earth, which you think is evil, evil matter, were created by him. All things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, he is now showing that even the angels you are worshipping, remember, they were created by Christ Jesus. But Jesus Christ is not a created being. He is God himself. Now, let's try to to, to, to wind this up by, 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 by looking at Hebrews. You see also the writer to the Hebrews is demonstrating again the supremacy of Christ. He's being the prototokos. That's what he's showing. The heir of all things. All things were created by him, through him, and for him. Therefore, him is what makes him the prototokos, which means he is the heir of all things. He has inheritance rights over everything. That's what the psalm says. Who is man that you are so mindful of him, that you made him a little lower than angels, but crowned him with glory and honor? And you set him over the works of your hands and gave him dominion over them. That's it. And he ends by saying, but we see Jesus, who was for a little season made a little, a little lower than angels for the purpose of dying, that he might taste death for every man by the grace of God. But this death was crowned with so much glory and honor that no angel can ever match that glory. Hallelujah. We are talking here about the deepest things about Christ Jesus, whom we worship. Now, let's finish here. Let's finish here. I just want to go to verse 5 of, of, of Hebrews 1. It says, for to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have fathered you. You see, this language of son, father, son, father, is what makes people think that, oh, you must have a father before a son is there, and so forth and so forth. These are some of the complexities, and people end up saying Christ was created 
And in another place he says, I will be his father and he will be my son. This is the Davidic promise that was made in Psalm, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. This is that quotation. Now again, listen to verse 6. This is where I want to spend time on. But when he brings his firstborn, that is the Prototokos, his firstborn into the world, this tells you that Christ Jesus pre-existed his humanity. He only became a human being at some point when he came into the world to be lower than angels for a little while. Even the word a little while is pregnant with meaning because it means he became what he is not in the normal course of things. In the normal course of things, he is just spirit. But he became lower than angels because angels don't die. So he had to become a human being who can die. That's where the lower than angels is coming from, right? Now, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God Worship him. Now, now listen here. If he is a created being, and we all understand that scripture says, God says, I'm so jealous of my glory, I will not share it with another. How come God speaking to the angels here says to his angels, Worship my son. But of the angels, he simply made them spirits and ministers as a flame of fire. But what does he say to his son? That's now verse 8. But of the son, he says, your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. And a righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. So God, your God has anointed you over your companions with the oil of rejoicing. Here now you hear God addressing his son as God. God, your God has. Oh God, your throne is forever. Let the angels of God worship him. He sustains all things. By the word of his power, he is the inheritor of everything. He is the heir of everything. He was appointed heir of all things. Then you are not a serious student of the Bible if after all this you conclude that Christ Jesus is a created being. He is not. He is the creator. I leave you in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.